Thank you so much, Lynn, and thanks for the invitation. It's always really great to come back to the Atwater Library. I've been here many times. I've given a couple of courses here with the QWF, and it's such a beautiful building and great location. It's just like to be in this place. <laughs> so thanks for the invite. Um, I'm going to do a PowerPoint. And There we go. So, as Lynn said, my name is Taris Gresco. I'm a journalist, a travel writer, and one of my main interests, one of my obsessions actually, is uh, food. I'm really interested in the intersection of food and the environment. I don't know if any of you remember, the, there's a copy of the book back there called The Devil's Picnic. I kind of went around the world looking at forbidden substances, everything from coca leaves in uh, Bolivia to clandestine absinthe in the Jura Valley of Switzerland. Um, and I was looking at the psychology of prohibition, how things can kind of backfire and make things more attractive by banning them. Another book I wrote was The uh, Bottom Feeder, which is all about uh, the crisis in the oceans, the way that human appetite is having a huge effect on rivers, lakes, and the oceans. Now, one of my main motivations and something that gets me out of bed in the morning is my fascination with intense tastes and aromas. I guess I have to confess that, you know, while I was writing Bottom Feeder, there was the environmental side of it, but I was also just really into tasting seafood from all around the world. And one of the secret motivations for this book, The Lost Supper, is my interest in intense flavors. I believe that intense flavors can enrich our lives and guide us to a nutritious, healthy diet without diminishing the ecosystems that sustain us all. So the idea for my latest book, The Lost Supper, came to me about eight years ago. I was kind of in an enviable position. I was working on an article about uh, wineries in uh, Greece. So it was a, a wine travel story. And I'd been invited to a tasting at a winery on the flanks of the Pan Guyon Hills, which are north of Thessaloniki. Small technical problem, excuse me. Anyways, while he's doing this, I was um, at the, this winery, and the vintner brought this bottle of wine that he'd found. We just, I just want to get it so it can uh, advance to the next slide. So the vintner was this history buff, and he poured me a glass of this beautiful cranberry-hued rosé. You can see it on the uh, right there. Um, it turned out to be a pretty remarkable wine. Uh, there were hints of sour cherry and fresh peppers. I'm going all uh, sommelier here, excuse me. Um, and way more tannins than I'm used to in a rosé. Uh, he explained it was an experimental vintage made from an odd grape about the size and shape of a Kalamata olive. He brought it out to us. It was a weird-looking grape that local shepherds had discovered growing wild in a grove of almond trees. He believed it was the same grape used to make Biblinos Inos, the sacred wine prized by the Phoenicians and Athenians in the 8th century BC. He hinted at the possibility, and I'm not sure whether I believed him or still believe him, that Homer himself had enjoyed this wine. There's a lot of marketing in wine. <laughs> a year later, I had a similar experience, this time with olives in Italy. A food magazine, Saveur, uh, sent me to the Lago di Garda area uh, to interview the country's champion potatore, or olive tree trimmer. Once again, I'm trying just to advance with the advance. It's not working. Um, I think it's wonderful that uh, Italy has these olive tree trimming competitions. And uh, he was the champion for like three years in a row, so I did a profile of this guy. His job was to climb up rickety ladders leaning against centuries-old trees to cut their branches and harvest their, their olives. So what do I need to do here? That's the one. Yeah, that's what I press and it doesn't advance. Maybe stay on hand just in case. Yeah. Um, 
so uh, it's not as easy as it looks, by the way. He taught me, he gave me, that's me trying to trim an olive tree. It's, uh, you have to climb up these little rickety little ladders, and it, he's amazing at it. He'd found an unknown olive variety growing on the ruins of a 2,000-year-old Roman villa. An analysis of the DNA showed it was a cultivar unknown to science, and almost certainly an ancient one. He named the extra virgin olive oil he pressed from these olives Villa Romana. Okay. For the for the viewers at home, we're having technical difficulties. Yeah. The taste, by the way, was fantastic and it was pretty unique. Beyond the grassy tastes of fresh, high-quality, extra virgin olive oil, it reminded me of sardines and anchovies. And I mean that in a good way. It actually reminded me of a sauce that I made later called garum, this ancient Roman fish sauce. That's it. But uh, when I press that button, it doesn't advance. Uh, what about... I'll oh, click that. Yeah. Okay. And to go back. Our apologies. Um, so these two experiences, uh, the experience of uh, drinking this crazy wine in Greece um, and testing this olive oil, which was really unique, set my writer's imagination racing. What would it be like, I wondered, if you could actually taste the past? In my travels around the world, I noticed how traditionally made foods packed an intensity of flavor that's lacking in the industrial foods that we find in supermarkets and all but the most innovative and expensive of restaurants. I had a hunch, too, that what we ate in the past was more varied, complex, and good for us than the ultra-processed foods that have taken over our diets. That sacred Greek wine, sipped looking out towards the Aegean Sea, along with the olive oil tasted near the ruins of a Roman villa, provided the starting point for the journey that became the book, The Lost Supper. <clears throat> Around the same time, I started reading about techniques that allowed archaeologists to analyze organic remains recovered from ancient and prehistoric sites. Scientists were taking these results and recreating wines, beers, meads, breads, and ancient recipes of all kinds. There was even a programmer in Silicon Valley, a guy with the unusual name of Seamus Blackley, one of the creators of the Xbox, who was using yeast sucked out of the pottery sitting around in the storerooms of museums to make Egyptian-style bread out of ancient grains like emmer and einkorn. Got Pretty good. I got to know the guy. He gave me some lessons in, uh, in, bed br in baking bread. I'd spent much of my career traveling over geography, undertaking long journeys to visit distant countries. But now I started thinking about the possibility of traveling not in space, but in time to the distant past. Today I'm going to talk to you about the journey that became the nine chapters of the book, The Lost Supper. But first, why look into the foodways of the past at all? I mean, apart from curiosity, which for me has always been a pretty good motivation. <laughs> Many of you will be aware that the world is undergoing a huge drop in biodiversity. Global heating, pollution, overfishing, and habitat destruction mean that the rate of species extinction is hundreds of times now than it has been at any time in the last 10 million years. According to some estimates, a quarter of the 8.7 million known plant and animal species alive today are likely to become extinct in the next few decades. What fewer people are aware of is the fact that agrobiodiversity, which refers to the range of plants and livestock that feeds us, is also in decline. According to the FAO, one-tenth of the 8,800 or so breeds of domesticated animals used in agriculture are already extinct. Six more uh, breeds go extinct every month. Since 1900, three-quarters of the genetic diversity once stored in farmers' fields has been lost. This loss of diversity is having a big impact on what we eat and on our health. In recent years, sunflower, soybean, and canola oil, these are referred to as seed oils, have replaced olive oil in Mediterranean nations, reducing lifespans in a region that was once famous for longevity and good health. 
In Mexico, land races of corn, each with its own distinct flavor and nutritional qualities, have been replaced by transgenic yellow corn, deficient in micronutrients imported from the US. Around the world, the loss of diversity means a sharp drop in omega-3 fatty acids, polyphenols, and other micronutrients essential for good health. They call what is available in supermarkets now the global standard diet. And the triumph of the global standard diet has led to an increase in what are known as the diseases of civilization, hypertension, which I apparently suffer from, I've just learned, <laughs> cancer, arthritis, asthma, diabetes, as well as a complex of conditions known as metabolic syndrome. For the first time in century, poor nourishment means that children in Canada and the United States can expect to live lives that are less long than those of their parents. Now, if you go into a Provigo or a Metro or even an Adonis, loss of diversity might not seem to be a big issue. High-end supermarkets stock organic beef, microbrews, heirloom tomatoes, kale, and once exotic grains like quinoa, amaranth, and spelt, foods imported from around the world. We seem to be living in a golden age of diversity. But behind this apparent embarrassment of riches, there's a real poverty of nutrition. In North America, nine out of 10 gallons of milk comes from just one breed of cows, the Holston Frisian, all of which are descended from just two bulls. Two bulls. The majority of the world's pork production is now based on the genetics of a single breed of pig, the white Danish land race. The market for seeds, which is the ultimate source of all of the world's agrobiodiversity and all our crops, is controlled by just four multinational companies. And half of the calories consumed on Earth, consumed on Earth come from just three glasses, grasses, all of them subject to either genetic modification or scientific hybridization, rice, corn, and wheat. Now consider this, when we look back into the past, they found at a single site in Africa's Rift Valley from 23,000 years ago, evidence that Paleolithic foragers feasted on 20 small and large animals, 16 families of birds, and 140 different kinds of fruit, nuts, seeds, and legumes. One well-preserved early Iron Age man recovered from a bog in Denmark had 60 different plant species in his stomach. All of them consumed in the day or two before he died. Here he is, by the way, my favorite Iceman, Otzi. They've done a beautiful recreation of the guy. I think he was about my age. Um, and uh, when he died, he was killed with an ax in the back of his head or an arrow in the back of his head. It's a, a real cold case because they discovered him in the uh, Italian Alps, frozen. Incredibly well-preserved body, which allowed us to go back and see what he was actually eating. Um, Interestingly enough, he was, had a fairly advanced case of arteriosclerosis. <laughs> maybe the traditional diets aren't all they are, they're cracked up to be, who knows. Or maybe he was, turns out he was eating a lot of fat, which might be part of the problem. His last meal was wild goat meat and bread made from einkorn, but he'd also eaten grains of hop hornbeam, fragments of bracken and mosses, he was taking bites out of a special mushroom that he kept in a medicine bag on his hip. Incredible what we can recreate these days, huh? Um, even today, hunter-gatherers, and he would have been a hunter-gatherer, have diets that are way more varied than ours. Anthropologists have found that the Hadza, who are nomads in northern Tanzania, consume 800 distinct plant and animal species. And hunter-gatherers, if they survive past infancy, can expect to live lives as long and often healthier and more active than people in settled agricultural societies like ours. Examples like these show that we've evolved to have diversity in our diets. We are omnivores, as Michael Pollan has said and many others, and our bodies and brains respond best to a wide variety of foods. I'm making the case that we should be diversivores. <laughs> that we should include diversity in our diet and we should strive to, if there's one thing we can do in the week, try new things, add new things to your diet. That's what we respond well to. In diversity lies resiliency. It's a message that applies to human cultures, natural ecosystems, and even to the microorganisms in our guts. 
And where can we find the greatest culinary and nutritional diversity? Certainly not in the limited range of foods I was talking about, the stuff we find in the supermarkets today. And probably not in the future, which if we choose to pursue lab-grown meat, patented transgenic produce, or some other forms of soylent green, is bound to be even less varied than what we eat today. Is anybody familiar with this? This is kind of a fad in Silicon Valley. It's this food uh, called Soylent. It's a tribute, I guess, to that old 1970s film with Charlton Heston, Soylent Green. Uh, and ironic, but there, kids in the Silicon Valley are actually getting like 20 to 25% of their calories per day from this stuff. It's just like a meal replacement that's supposed to have all of the nutrients in it. Uh, for some people, that's food is just fuel. I believe we need to look to the past, the huge variety of foods we've eaten through the course of our species 300,000 years of existence, of diversity that we're now at risk of losing. Now, food that has long fascinated me and kind of was one of the, the, the motivations behind doing this book is this ancient Roman secret sauce called garum, also known as liquamen. It appears in almost every recipe in Apicius, which is the biggest compendium of recipes that survives from Roman times. This is a mosaic from Pompeii, uh, and one of the villas there was owned by a merchant of Garum, and this was found in the floor of the villa. Uh, it shows an amphora with his sort of brand name on it. I decided to go to Spain's Atlantic coast, where I met with a team of food scientists and archaeologists who had managed to recover traces of the sauce from amphorae that were buried after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in the year 79. They used scanning electron microscopes and gas chromatography and identified major organic molecules and followed ancient recipes to recreate this umami-rich secret sauce. So this is actually remains of the garum, powdered remains of the garum that I saw at the lab in Cadiz in the south of Spain. And uh, kind of stuck my nose into it and got a whiff of this vaguely fishy smelling uh, powdery residue. After they'd recreated it, they introduced it to leading chefs in Cadiz, and I got to go to some of the restaurants, and the, the chefs were doing great work with it. They were kind of taking it and running with it. Some of them were doing it as sort of a soy sauce type thing, but other ones were really trying to work it into the traditional Spanish uh, seafood cookery that they were so good at. If you've ever heard of noak mam or nam pla, the uh, Asian fish sauces, the process is pretty similar to making it. Uh, the, in the Far East, uh, they use, um, tend to use black anchovies. Uh, this, uh, the Romans used sardines. Uh, they used tuna, bluefin tuna, huge fish. And they've even found garum factories on the coast of uh, northern France, um, Portugal, North Africa, some that were so large that they could salt down whales to make whale garum. It, it's, I've, used to, I've, I've learned to use this in my cooking. Um, I I've made my own, and I've incorporated it into my cooking, and it's a pretty interesting flavor. I'll tell you more about it. So in order to, after it's sort of inspired by this experience and the flavors I had in the south of Spain, I decided to make my own garum at home in the Montreal winter under the guidance of a woman named Sally Granger, who's a British expert in Roman cooking. I spent three and a half months fermenting garum from these Portuguese sardines, which I brought from a grocery store on the plateau, using a seedling mat to keep it warm, a Coleman camping cooler, and a jelly strainer. This, by the way, is the recreated garum that is available in uh, the south of Spain. And here are the sardines that I bought to make my own. Uh, I asked for archaeological supervision because, let's say, the risks of botulism when you're making this at home are uh, non-negligible. <laughs> so I, I needed, I definitely needed guidance. It's now become, it worked though. It turned out after three and a half months, I got this amazing sort of coruscating gold liquid. Not very much of it, but it's incredibly flavorful. Um, 
It's now become a secret ingredient in my own cooking. It brings savory intensity to stews and pastas. It's really good in the puttanesca sauce. Um, making garum for me was a way of discovering how unfamiliar, but also how delicious ancient cooking actually was. If you think Roman cooking was just sort of like, you know, uh, a form of Italian cookery, it's not. It has a lot more t in common with Cantonese cooking. There's a really interesting mix of uh, sweet and sour in it. Uh, they didn't have a access to a lot of New World uh, uh, plants, of course, like tomatoes and potatoes and that kind of thing. And their palette of spices was different, but they really did enjoy intense flavors. And in almost every recipe, you have this crazy secret sauce that really, like, brings harmony and intensity. It's kind of like melting anchovies into a sauce, you know what I mean? But it's like a, a ready-made form of it. So this inspired me to do other experiments. I decided to mill my own grain using a grindstone and a variety of wheat known as emmer to make a Neolithic flatbread. So I'm, I was trying to kind of travel in time in my own kitchen. Fortunately, the pandemic was happening, so I had a little more time than usual. <laughs> I say fortunately. Uh, well, it, it did give me the luxury of time, and a, a lot of cases doing these things took months uh, to bring them to fruition. So with the Neolithic fl flatbread, I was working on a chapter on sourdough, and that took me to a place called Çatalhöyük in central Turkey. Now, Çatalhöyük is a really interesting place. It was the largest settlement in the world 8,000 years ago. There's me looking heroic outside the Chattelhoyak site out near uh, Konya in uh, Turkey. People there lived in tightly mud packed mud brick houses, which you entered through holes in the roof. Though the residents of this proto city continued to hunt and forage, the archaeobotanical evidence showed they also made bread. Almost every house had uh, an oven, which resembles contemporary ovens in Turkey called firins. This is a recreation on the site of one of the houses. Bread often gets blamed for being the foundation of oppressive centralized states. I'm thinking of the pharaohs keeping the workers, building the pyramids happy with rations of beer and bread, the whole Roman institution of bread and circuses. In Chattelhoyuk, though, uh, life was egalitarian. All the houses were about the same size, with the tasks shared out between men and women. There's very little evidence of social stratification that leads to inequality. So my thesis was that, you know, bread gets blamed for a lot of things. It gets, gets blamed for inequality. It's like we settled down in order to pay, have access to bread and, uh, and beer, and uh, that ended up leading to the inequalities in society. Here is a place where bread was consumed on a daily basis, but it was a relatively egalitarian place. So once again, I went out into the world, but came back home and brought the lessons back home to my own kitchen. Uh, I'd been baking sourdough for uh, several years um, before the process of this, writing this book started. Uh, I had several kilograms of that ancient grain called emmer shipped from British Columbia, and I bought a metate, which is a Central American grindstone. So when I was, you can maybe see the grindstone here um, in the illustration. It's that oval-shaped thing in the middle of the picture near the floor. Um, I found an equivalent to that. I talked to archaeologists and said the closest things you can find here are volcanic rock metates, which are these grindstones, which are common for grinding corn in Mexico. Um, and then I went about the process of grinding it, and it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Fortunately, I had some helpers. I had my, uh, at the time, six-year-old son, Victor, who uh, decided to chip in. You can see him reducing the ember into powder. He gave up after a, few, after a few passes. He's wearing, for some reason, a Pokemon trainer's outfit. Uh, that explains it's not a, it's not a baker's outfit. Um, it took about five hours to grind enough grain for a family of four. So... That gave me new respect for the whole idea of the daily grind, right? The fact that you really had to want bread. Um, you, you know, it's, uh, it was a lot of work. 
in some societies, like in Egypt, it was mostly done by women. And actually, when you look at the uh, skeletal remains of women in many women in ancient Egypt, the working women, their toes were pointed upwards um, because over the course of a lifetime, they would have been on their knees grinding, grinding, grinding. Um, as I say, in Chattelhoyak, it was a lot more egalitarian. Men and women probably shared this task. So once I had that, I had another problem. I had the flour. Um, I formed the dough. I added some wild mustard seeds, because there are a lot of wild mustard seeds found at the site in, uh, in Chattelhoyak for flavoring. Um, and it's been found in the, bre in the bread. They have these archaeobotanical botan uh, analyses that are quite, quite good these days. I found mine in an Iranian grocery store here in Montreal. Um, my challenge then was to find an equivalent of that oven, the firin, right? So I remember there's this amazing Turkish chef here in uh, Montreal, Fisin Erkan. And uh, I reached out to her, and she invited me to her restaurant. Uh, it's a beautiful farm to table restaurant in saint jean sur richelieu um, called Bika. And she was, uh, she was game. So she fired up her firin, um, which is made of clay. And this is, you know, kind of a larger version of what you would have seen in Chattel Hoyek. But basically the same thing. It's amazing how there's sort of continuity between, you know, these Neolithic settlements and ovens that are used in contemporary Turkey. Fison rolled out the dough and formed it into a flatbread. We then put it into our oven, which had been preheated, and here's a, here's a Quebec touch with maple wood. The result was really fantastic. The bread puffed up in the oven, and when he ripped into it, a little puff of steam escaped. I started to realize, like, maybe, you know, it was the deliciousness of this bread, along with things like beer, were enough to keep people in place, to keep people settled down. It's like, you know what, we can go out hunting, but this bread is pretty good. <laughs> and and Chattelhoyak is interesting because it was at this sweet spot between where hunter-gatherers and sort of settled agriculture. They did a bit of both. And if you look at their houses there, they're just full of tributes to the natural world. Uh, amazing, like, you know, horns set into the wall, uh, walls, amazing mosaics of, you know, what they saw in the natural world. But they were always coming home to get their bread. Um, we had ours with a little bit of olive oil and feta cheese, which helped uh, not strictly authentic ingredients. What I loved about this was that we managed to do an end run around the agricultural revolutions, the Neolithic, the industrial, the green. No roller mills, no co commercial yeast, no hybrid wheat. Just the natural goodness and all the amino acids and intense flavor of an ancient grain. So since then, kind of inspired by these experiences, I've started doing a little bit of, uh, of uh, home cooking with uh, kef making my own kefir, kombucha, kimchi, yogurt, and simple cheeses like uh, paneer and ricotta. Oops. Oh, by the way, here's the, uh, here's the bread coming out of the oven. It's beautiful. I make my own kimchi. My, my, my sons help me uh, massage the cabbage, and I put a little bit of the garum in it to substitute for the fish sauce that goes into kimchi. It's actually, it works out very well. I call this up my Silk Road kimchi. Here's what these, all these crazy experiments have taught me. When it comes to food, the secret to time travel is that humans alive today are identical in physique, intelligence, and problem-solving abilities to just about anybody who's lived in the last 60,000 years. These are not only our ancestors going back 60,000 years are anatomically modern, but also behaviorally modern. Um, we, they, they, they could solve the same problems that we could. They were ingenious individuals, as my explorations in food history taught me. When confronted with a problem like how to build a shelter or assemble a meal, they drew on a, the exact set of innate capacities that we have too. The challenge is to see the world through their eyes. Once you know that, the only things you need to go back into the past are curiosity and imagination. One thing I was determined to investigate in the Last Supper was a herb that's kind of considered the holy grail of food history. 2,000 years ago, a plant that the Greeks knew as Silphion disappeared from the face of the earth. According to Pliny the Elder, the last stock of Silphion was shipped from North Africa to Rome, 
where it was said to have ended up in the huge belly of the Emperor Nero. Silphion, which the Romans called Silphium or laser, you see it in all the recipes, or many recipes in Apicius, that uh, compendium of uh, recipes I talked about. It was prized for its intoxicating aroma and a flavor that transformed everything from a plate of scalded sow's womb to a pot of lentils into a dish fit for the gods. The disappearance of Silphion is considered the first extinction of any plant or animal species in recorded history. Of course, many extinctions probably happened before, but this is the first one that was written about. It's also considered a cautionary tale in how thoroughly human appetite can extirpate a species from the wild. That's why I was intrigued when a plant matching the description of Silphion, Ferula drudiana, was discovered growing in the center of Turkey. With a guy called Mahmut Miski, a professor of pharmacognosy at the University of Istanbul, Istanbul, I traveled to an orchard on the flanks of Mount Hassan, which is an extinct volcano near Konya, where for centuries the plant had been protected from the attentions of browsing goats and sheep by stone walls. Oops. Here's the plant, here's what we found. We took several stalks of it back to Istanbul, where Sally Granger, now she's the archaeologist who helped me make garum, uh, flew in from England and used the resin to replicate dishes from a picius. Um, Ranger made uh, prawns and sylphion sauce, lamb with sweet wines and plum, and sautéed squash. Once again, following these ancient recipes, being careful to make versions without the herb as a control. So the guy standing uh, uh, behind me is Mamut Miski, whose article kind of led me to Istanbul, and that's Sally Granger, who I kind of think of uh, as the Julia Child of ancient cookery. <laughs> the results were impressive, if not conclusive. The presumed sylphion plant brought an intense green herbal flavor to the foods, while drawing other ingredients like fish sauce, honey, and sweet wine into a harmonious whole. It had kind of a similar effect as garum does. It's a fascinating plant, said Granger, and I can understand why the Romans craved it. Quite apart from its medicinal qualities, whether it was a soporific or a stimulant, it just tasted great, and it did. I mean, it's hard to describe this sort of intoxicating flavor, but it really brought another dimension to the dishes. And it helped me understand why the Romans went to such great efforts to bring it from North Africa, and maybe why they ate it to extinction. Unfortunately, the risk of extinction remains. There's only about 600 of these plants left in the wild. Um, and so far, it's proved resistant to propagation in botanical gardens, which means that it's entirely possible that human curiosity and desire could wipe out the few hundred plants that have survived into our century. So I was willing to give Sylphion a try at work, she brought her own mortar and pestle from, uh, from, Inc., from London and uh, traveled with all these spices, including her own garum. Unless I can be assured that it comes from a sustainable source, I'm not gonna eat it again. As I mentioned, I aspire to be an ethical Epicurean and I consider it a tragedy if I contributed to the definitive extinction of what's known as a Lazarus species. This is a species that brought, that's brought back from the dead. We no longer live in the Neolithic when the human population numbered in the millions. If even a small percentage of the billions of us now alive decide to go back to hunting, fishing, and foraging from the wilds, we'll very quickly exhaust the planet's already overstrained ecosystems. In many places, I discover that some of the foods we cherish today are going the way of the Silphion of the ancients. On the shores of the Mediterranean, olive trees, some of them, uh, some of which are 2,000 and more years old, are turning black and dying a victim of a disease called Cellella fastidiosa. Here's a, here's a healthy olive tree, which you know is probably about a thousand years old, uh, from Puglia in the heel of Italy's boot. I was shocked to see what's becoming of this landscape. Uh, the massive, beautifully contorted millennial trees are dying. All that's left in many places are heartbreaking skeleton forests. You can see the, the leaves of the afflicted plants. They kind of curl inwards like dried cinnamon. 
the plague, which was caused by a bacteria on an ornamental coffee plant imported from Costa Rica in 2008, is playing havoc with the global supply of extra virgin olive oil. You might have noticed the prices have gone up quite a bit lately for olive oil. Part of it is related to the disease, part of that's related to drought, uh, particularly in Spain uh, and Crete, not much rainfall. It's a shame because olive oil, honestly, is a, staple, a cornerstone of my diet. It's one of the healthiest fats you can eat. Our current backup plan in the face of declining diversity is to keep the seeds and semen of plants and livestock in gene banks. I went to a gene bank for olives in Cordoba, Spain, and met the lovely staff there. Um, one for corn in Mexico. There's another one for rice in the Philippines. There is even a sourdough, sourdough starter gene bank in uh, Belgium. They have a sample of 120-year-old sourdough from the Yukon. There's another, and there's the mother of them all, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, which is located north of the Arctic Circle on an island halfway between the Norwegian mainland and the North Pole. The, the problem is that seeds kept inert in cold storage can't evolve with and adapt to changes in the environment. And gene banks turn out to be vulnerable to conflict. Uh, I talked to uh, the founder of one in Syria, which was looted at the beginning of the Syrian war. And uh, the one in Kharkiv uh, in Ukraine, uh, which had 160,000 samples from around the world, was shelled and partially destroyed by the Russians at the beginning of the war. It's now been relocated to the western part of Ukraine. What we need to seek out and encourage is living diversity, which is stored in fields, forests, grasslands, and wetlands, environments that are now threatened by human encroachment. That's what I discovered in Italy. Farmers in Puglia found that certain ancient olive varieties were resistant to the bacteria. And if you grafted them onto the trees before they got sick, entire orchards could be saved. So they found sort of wild versions of the olives growing alongside the big trees, grafted them onto them, and they saved some of these thousand-year-old olive trees. It's one of the best. It's a lot of work, but it actually does work, and it's probably the best hope for saving them. The same threat incidentally exists for coffee, whose habitat is being altered by increased rainfall and heat, for grains, which can be wiped out by diseases like uh, wheat rust, and for wine, as rising temperatures threaten the production of common grape varietals in Bordeaux and the Napa Valley. The best hope for such important species is to seek out land races, which is a term for locally adapted varieties, and crop wild relatives whose genes might hold the key to surviving a changing climate and novel pathogens. Not only to find them, but to plant them, cultivate them, and yes, to eat them. I'm making another case for introducing diversity into our diets, because we are actually helping support the di genetic diversity of the world by doing that. The research for this book took me to a barrier island off the coast of Georgia, where explorers deliberately stranded a herd of black-footed Spanish hogs, which had been fattening up for the last 500 years on acorns and crabs. The charming pint-sized Osaba Island hog. <laughs> I visited the markets and high-end restaurants of Mexico City, where ex uh, edible insects like escamoles, ant eggs, and champo locos, maguey worms, are the most expensive things on the menus of white uh, tablecloth restaurants. And you know what? They are actually delicious. They deserve their reputation. These are the maggie worms, which you eat in uh, tortillas. They, uh, they were, I understood why the people paid so much for them and the, why they're so prized. They have this delightful sort of almond buttery kind of flavor. I went to the Yorkshire Dales on a more appetizing note, where a very brave family of dairy farmers was making English, England's oldest named cheese, Wensleydale, from a breed of critically endangered cows, the Northern Dairy Shorthorn. Everywhere I went, I encountered a similar story. People were struggling to preserve traditional foods against the onslaught of industrial hyper-processed foods. They deserve our support. We can find a lot of people doing similar things here in Quebec, by the way, 
I always brought this back home because these foods are not all always available to us. Here in Quebec, for example, there are there's the amazing pied de vent cheese, which is made from a breed of cows called the Canadiennes, which were brought over by Jacques Cartier. And they're still, it's still being made on um, uh, Les Îles de la Madeleine. Amazing cheese available in most stores around here. So I'm making the case that we should be able to, we should be willing to seek out and sometimes pay more for these extraordinary foods. Doing so is not only good for our planet, it's good for our own well-being. The latest research, research shows that building diversity into your diet is crucial for good health. So being a diversivore, as I've said, is not just a question of like novelty or interesting new tastes. They say that people who have 30 or more plant species a week in their diet um, are significantly freer from disease than people who even eat uh, an exclusively vegan and vegetarian diet. The looming crisis in food security isn't going to be solved by individual choices alone, unfortunately. The world's population is heading to 10 billion by mid-century. And according to the FAO, we're going to have to find a way to produce 50% more calories by that time. As of last year, 829 million people around the world were considered seriously undernourished. That's an increase of 150 million in just three years. But the gravest threats to the food supply come from soil depletion, water scarcity, emerging pathogens, and the global heating that's making crop harvests and fishery catches more unpredictable. I don't, know if any, I don't know if you remember this book, but when I was a kid, this was on all the, the, all the paperback racks. It seems like some of the dystopian visions of an overpopulated planet that I grew up with in the 1970s are becoming a reality. People are actually eating Soylent. The best hope for the future of the world's food supply I saw in my travels was actually in traditional approaches to agriculture and the stewardship of land and water in what is known as TEK, traditional ecological knowledge. In the second to last uh, chapter of the book, I returned to the biome of my youth, British Columbia, the territory of the Coast Salish, to meet indigenous knowledge keepers who explained what had become of chemas, a plant that I'd never heard of, but it was a staple um, before the coming of the Europeans, the most traded thing on the coast uh, after uh, smoked salmon. It's a tiny little bulb. They get, the bulbs get a lot bigger than this that are cooked in uh, pit roasts or earth ovens. They produce this beautiful sort of starchy, Swedish um, chestnut, almost like uh, thing. It's a real delicacy. Um, and the greatest example of TEK, traditional ecological knowledge, is the controlled or cultural burn. Controlled burn structured the landscape of the Americas before the coming of the Europeans. Without regular burning, the prairies of the Midwest, the grasslands of the Argentine Pampas, the hills of Mexico, and the high plains of the Andes would have been invaded by forest. Controlled burns created the Camas Meadows of the Coast Salish, which I saw in British Columbia, as well as a park-like oak landscape the conquistadors encountered in the American Southeast. Indigenous groups have been lobbying for permission to do cultural burns, to clear the landscape of the underbrush and deadfall, the fuel ever more devastating wildfires in Western Canada. If done in the spring, when conditions are damp, these burns can be controlled. Turns out that indigenous cultivating techniques may also help to reduce the damage from the wildfires that are currently ravaging North America. I talked to some, thank you for the Kleenex, by the way. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Um, I talked to uh, some uh, Cowichan guy who said, you know, one thing that white people really hate, it's lighting things on fire. They don't want us to do that. And uh, it's too bad because these controlled burns actually do structure landscapes. They're very helpful. And, uh, you know, it's one way to fight the wildfires that, we'll, that we're seeing more and more of every year. Another example of TEK is the Milpa system. This is a beautiful Camas meadow, by the way, in uh, southern British Columbia. Um, and uh, there's a Gary Oak in the background, and these bloom purple. You don't want to eat the white flower Camas, though, because that's called the death Camas. And, uh, you know, just brushing it against your lips can send you into convulsions. 
So uh, this is the famous milpa system, planting squash, corn, and beans, as well as chiles, uh, which originated in Mexico and uh, spread north to become the three sisters method of the Iroquois. It keeps fields fertile without the need for fallowing or chemical fertilizers. Another thing I saw in my travels with the chinampas. These are very cool. In Mexico City, the, um, the uh, Spanish thought they were floating gardens. Um, they actually, the roots draw water from the uh, canals underneath. They allow several harvests a year. And they're being used in places like Poland and Bangladesh now. Um, to allow harvests uh, in watery landscapes. Very, very good for providing food to large cities. And of course, Mexico City, known as Tenochtitlan, had I think a population of about a million and they fed them from these things. There's also the dark nutrient rich earth known as Terra Preta do Indio, which is in the Amazon. This is anthro this is like human-made dirt, basically. It's been formed over centuries, sometimes millennia. It's incredibly rich. It's because people added human manure, they added pottery, the ceramics, and made the Amazon, which is generally pretty infertile, into a, a place where they could raise plants sustainably for up to a millennia, uh, up to a millennium. Um, the current slash and burn techniques exhaust the soil in only a few years, but indig indigenous Amazonians actually improve the soil. Terra Preta, which as you can see can be up to six feet deep, has twice the nutrients of other tropical soils. So indigenous people account for just 5% of the world's population, but they occupy 20% of the Earth's land area. And that land is crucially important because it contains 80% of the world's biodiversity. That's where the real future is. It's not in lab-grown meat or protein pancakes, as journalists like George Monbiata tell us, or increased automation of concentrated animal feeding operations. It's not in gene banks, as comforting and important as their existence is. The real future of the food we eat is contained in the past in farming and land management techniques that enrich the soil and water rather than depleting them. It involves turning away from industrial agriculture, which is a challenge for us individually, and the damaging philosophy of growth for its own sake. We're fortunate that it's not too late, that this traditional knowledge hasn't been completely lost. In my travels, I discovered a lot of it. It's, it's out there. But we have to know where to look and who to ask, and should indigenous knowledge keepers choose to share what they know, be willing to learn from their wisdom. I'll leave you with this. When it comes to tigers, whales, elephants, and other endangered wildlife, as well as fragile plant species like sylphion, the best we can do is spare them from predation and exploitation and give them the room they need to live. In other words, leave them alone and allow them to thrive. As for the ancestral grains, wild yeasts, and forgotten livestock breeds that have enriched the human diet over the years, the way forward lies in reviving them, cultivating them, herding them, and consuming them. The secret to saving the world's dwindling nutritional diversity, it turns out, is as simple as it is counterintuitive. To save it, you've got to eat it. Well, thank you, Terrace. You've whetted our appetites in, in many ways. Um, your, your, your work is important. Uh, thank you for the books you've written, and, and thank you for giving.